The following is an audiobook recording of James R. Boyd's Daily Communion with God on the plan recommended by Rev. Matthew Henry for beginning, spending, concluding each day with God. Part 2 How to Spend the Day with God It will be useful and safe to adopt as in reference to the early morning hour the motto of the great Hebrew king. On thee do I wait all the day. We are to understand this expression as implying an expectation of favours from God and the act of seeking them so long as they are deferred. David had offered the prayer, Lead me in thy truth and teach me. Being in suspense as to the course of action he should pursue, he says to God, On thee I will wait all the day. He had also called him the God of his salvation, the being on whom he regarded his deliverance from various dangers and difficulties as depending, the being from whom alone he expected a spiritual as well as a temporal and outward salvation. So highly did he appreciate what he desired of God that he expresses his willingness and his purpose to wait for it all the day until it should be granted. It is not enough for us to begin the day with God, but during and throughout the day we are to wait upon Him. Number one, this implies a life of desire towards God, not only towards the good things which are in His gift, but towards God Himself, the manifestation of His glorious attributes and the exercise of his grace upon us. The devout man waits on him as the beggar waits on his benefactor, with earnest desires to obtain needful supplies, or as the diseased at the pool of Bethesda waited for the stirring of the water and for the expected cure. The idea is most fully conveyed in the psalmist's own language, O God, thou art my God, Early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me, thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, there is none upon earth that I desire besides thee. It is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God. Thus upon the wings of holy desire should our souls be ever soaring upwards towards God and pressing towards the attainments, the Spirit of heaven. We should ever strive to know more of God, to become more like Him, to be brought into closer fellowship and into more active and useful service. It is not sufficient to have a season of earnest worship in the morning, but that spiritual desire which is the soul of prayer should be kept alive through the day. The bent or inclination of the soul must tend towards God, towards serving Him in all that we do and enjoying Him in all that He bestows. This state of mind is intended in the commands given to pray always, to pray without ceasing, to continue in prayer. Oh, could I find from day to day a nearness to my God? Then would my hours glide sweet away while leaning on His word. Lord, I desire with Thee to live anew from day to day, in joys the world can never give, nor ever take away. Number 2. To wait upon God is to live a life of delight in God. As the lover waits on the object of his affection, desire is love in motion. As a bird on the wing, delight is love at rest. As a bird upon the nest, though our desire must still be so towards God that we must be wishing for more of God, 
yet our delight must go so in God that we must never wish for more than God. Regarding Him as all-sufficient, we must be satisfied with Him. Is it a pleasure to us to think of God, of His existence, attributes, providence and glorious sovereignty? Do we look up to Him with conscious satisfaction? Do we glory in Him as our God? Do we value Him above all worldly good? Do we expect more from Him? Is the heart so full of God and Christ and grace that it now spontaneously says, Return unto thy rest, O my soul. Here repose thyself. Here alone look for thy chief and most permanent happiness. The regenerate and sanctified soul dwells in God, is in him continually pleased, and whatever disturbance is felt from external sources is more than balanced by what it finds in God. Number 3. To wait on God is to depend on Him for all needful good. As the child waits on his father in whom he confides and on whom he casts all his care, it is to expect all good to come to us from God that He shall deem expedient and best to bestow upon us. Thus David explains the matter. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. Psalm 62.5 That is to no other, independently of Him, do I look for the good I need, for I know that every creature is that to me, and no more than He makes it to be. And our expectations from God, as far as they are guided by and grounded upon His word, ought to be humbly confident. The eyes of all wait upon him, for he is good to all, but especially may his saints direct their eyes to him, for he is in a peculiar manner and degree good to Israel. Number 4. To wait upon God is to live a life of devotedness to him. As the servant waits on his master to learn his will and to do his work and to advance his honour, and interest. To wait on God is to yield ourselves cheerfully to His disposal and guidance and to acquiesce in His arrangements respecting us. We should have such supreme regard for Him, such confidence in His wisdom, equity, and goodness, such a sense of our dependence and obligation as to resolve our own will into His and to accommodate our own will to his. As the eyes of a servant are to the hand of his master, and as the eyes of a maiden to the hand of her mistress, so must our eyes wait upon the Lord to do what he appoints, to take what he apportions to us. Thy will be done. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? In like manner, the glory of God is to be consulted. We are to do him honour. This is the part of a faithful servant. The will of God, therefore, is to be our rule of action every day. We must wait on him to receive his commands as recorded in the scriptures, with a resolution to comply with them, although they may contradict our corrupt inclinations or interfere with our secular interests. We are to make the will of God as shown in His providence the rule of our patience. We know it is God who performs all things for us and should be assured that all He does shall be made to work for good to those who love Him. And in order to do that, we ought to acquiesce in and accommodate ourselves to the entire will of God. To wait on the Lord is to say, Let him do to me as seemeth good to him, because we know that nothing seemeth good to him that is not really good. It is to say, Not as I will, but as thou wilt. It is to bring our mind into accordance with our condition so as to be calm and serene, whatever may occur that is fitted to render us uneasy. I was dumb 
I opened not my mouth, not because it was of no use to complain, but because thou didst it, and therefore I had no reason to complain. And this sentiment, this state of mind, will reconcile us to every affliction, to one as well as to another, because whatever it may be, it is the will of God, and that is ever determined by supreme wisdom and goodness. Whatever disposition God shall make of us, or of our affairs, we may be assured that as he does us no wrong, so he means no injury to us. Thy way, not mine, O Lord, however dark it be, lead me by thine own faithful hand, choose out the path for me. Smooth let it be or rough, it will be still the best, winding or straight it matters not, it leads me to thy rest. I dare not choose my lot, I would not if I might, Choose thou for me, my gracious God, so shall I walk aright. The kingdom that I seek is thine, so let the way that leads to it be truly thine, else I must surely stray. The duty of waiting upon God might be illustrated by referring to various other expressions of Holy Scripture that describe the homage which we owe to God and the communion which it is our interest to maintain with him. It is to set God always before us, Psalm 16, 8, to look upon him as ever near to us, as always observing us and noticing what we do, as one to whom we are accountable. It is to acknowledge him in all our ways, Proverbs 3, 6, to look to him in all our undertakings, for direction and success, to commit our way to him, saying, If thy presence go not up with us, carry us not up hence. To notice his kind hand in all the comforts dispensed to us, and in all the crosses laid upon us. To bless the name of the Lord, both when he gives and when he takes. Having thus explained what is to be understood by waiting upon God, it is now to be shown that this must be our practice every day and all the day long. We must wait on God every day, on Sabbath days not only, but on weekdays. The Lord's Day is especially to be devoted to waiting upon God in the sanctuary, in the family, in the closet, but on all other days also it is our duty and our interest to wait upon Him. Every day of the week, as well as on the Sabbath, we stand in need of the divine mercies that are to be thus secured and have work to do for God, in which his assistance is thus to be sought. Indeed, our waiting upon him during the first day of the week is adapted and designed to fit us for communion with him during the other days thereof so that we do not really fulfill the design of the Sabbath unless the spiritual impressions then received abide with us and regulate our minds and hearts in all the business and trials and moral dangers of the week. Thus from one Sabbath to another, our souls are to be maintained in a proper Christian slate. We must be so in the spirit of the Lord's day as to walk in the Spirit all the week. Even when engaged in the details of some worldly business, our hearts may be waiting upon God by cherishing an habitual regard to Him, to His providence as our guide, and to His glory as our end. And thus we may abide with Him in our ordinary worldly pursuits and vocation, even those who rise up early and sit up late and eat the bread of carefulness in their worldly business, owe it to their interest as well as piety to wait on God, because otherwise their labor may be vain. Psalm 127 verses 1 and 2 Vain were all our toil and labor, did not God that labor bless. Vain without his grace and favor, 
every talent we possess. Even on those days when ordinary business is laid aside and we give ourselves to agreeable recreation, this business of waiting on God must not be laid aside, for we must ever hold the first place in our regard and we require his continual aid to guard us against the temptations which may cluster in the paths of social or of personal enjoyment. Both in days of prosperity and adversity alike is it our duty and our interest to wait upon our God. Let our wealth be ever so increased. We are not thereby rendered independent of Him. We are under obligations to make a proper use of it as His stewards. We are to ask His blessing on what we have and to depend on His gracious providence for the continued possession and comfort of it. It is also requisite that we supplicate wisdom and grace to use our wealth for our worldly influence from all sources for the high and holy purposes which our Maker had in view when He led us into our present possessions. Aware also of the precarious tenure by which we hold worldly goods of any sort, it behooves us to wait upon our God for better things than this world affords even to the most favoured. And when the world frowns upon us, and disappointments arise, and afflictions assail our comfort and our peace, we must not thereby be tempted to withdraw ourselves from the good habit of waiting upon God. One grand design, we may suppose, of afflictions is to bring us more frequently and closely to the throne of grace to teach us how to pray with a more childlike and humble spirit, and to make the word of God more precious in our estimation and more beneficial to our souls. Then we are taught to approach our God with greater satisfaction than ever as the God of hope, of consolation and of joy and we are led to appreciate our Saviour as the great High Priest, who is torched with our infirmities and regards our troubles and our griefs with God-like sympathy. More moulded to thy will, Lord, let thy servant be higher and higher still, liker and liker thee. Leave not that is unmeet of all that is mine own. Strip me and so complete my training. For thy throne. In the days of youth and in the days of old age alike, it is fitting and wise to wait upon God. The scriptures set before us the beautiful picture of the child Samuel ministering to the Lord, and they describe to us that memorable scene near Jerusalem when our Saviour was delighted with the joyous hosannas of the children during his triumphal entrance into that devoted city, the more early in life we begin to wait upon God, the more honour we put upon him and the greater benefit we procure to ourselves. And when old age approaches, we are concerned to continue our waiting upon him for support and comfort under its ever-increasing infirmities, and for a more abundant entrance to be daily expected into his everlasting kingdom and glory. Those who have done the will of God and are no longer capable of laborious exertion in his service have need of a graceful patience in waiting for the time of inheriting the promises, and the nearer they approach to the happiness they were waiting for, the dearer to them should be that gracious and glorious God on whom they wait and with whom shortly they hope to dwell in heaven and that forever. Having shown how and why we should wait on our God every day, the next point is to show that we are to wait upon Him all the day. From early morning to latest night, we must continue waiting upon God. Whatever changes of employment there may be in the course of the day, it must be the invariable attitude of our souls to attend upon Him 
and to regard His will and His glory in whatever we undertake and pursue. Number one, we must cast our daily cares upon Him, believing that His providence extends to all our affairs and to all events in which we shall be concerned, and to all the circumstances of them, however minute and seemingly accidental. We are to believe His gracious promise that all things shall work together for good to those who love Him and then to yield ourselves to Him, to do with us and ours as may seem good to Him, and having done so, then to rest satisfied and resolve to abide calmly the result. We are to bring our cares to God by prayer in the morning to spread them before Him, and then to make it appear all the day by the composure and cheerfulness of our minds that we did leave them with him, as Hannah did, who, when she had prayed, went away and did eat, and was no more sad. 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 18 Number 2. We must manage our daily business for him. With an eye to his providence that placed us in the situation and employment to which we are devoted, and with an eye to his precept, making diligence our duty, with an eye further to his blessing as that which is needed to make our occupation comfortable and productive, and above all, with an eye to his glory as our highest and noblest end. This dignifies our commonest actions and brings them into a sacred relation to God and makes them more pleasant to ourselves. If Gaius on parting with certain friends accompanies them a short way upon their journey. It is but an instance of common civility. But if he manifests this respect to them because they belong to Christ and for his sake, and further, that he may have religious intercourse with them for a longer period, it then becomes an act of Christian virtue. The Apostle Paul has given us this general rule applicable to every day and to every hour of the day. Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Colossians 3.17 And thus, through the Mediator, we wait on our God and find acceptance with Him. They who serve in households or in other capacities are instructed how to wait on the Lord in their common employments. See Ephesians 6, 5-8 and Colossians 3, 22-24. Number 3. We must wait on God as our daily benefactor. Look to Him for our daily bread, for all the comforts and accommodations of our earthly state, and for His blessing to rest upon them, that our health, happiness and usefulness may be subserved. No inducement to honesty and fidelity and moderation can be stronger than the habit of regarding God as the source of what we possess, to whom we are strictly accountable as stewards for the right use of all that we have. It is not once a week that we are to wait upon Him for our temporal blessings. As people in some places go to the market to buy provisions for the whole week, but we must wait upon him continually as dependent on him for the blessings which are conveyed to us every successive hour. Number four. The temptations of every day are to be resisted and the duties of every day are to be undertaken in reliance upon divine grace for the strength which is required. Our master has taught us to pray not only for our daily bread, but for deliverance daily from temptation. We engage in no business, we partake of no enjoyments that have not snares attending them. Not only in the morning must we put ourselves under the protection of God's grace, but through all the day we must keep ourselves under the shelter of that grace which will not suffer us to be tempted above our ability to resist and to overcome. Only in the Lord and in the power of His might can we be sufficiently strong. Again, we have various duties to perform. Opportunities will occur or should be sought 
for speaking good words and doing good works, and we must look up to God for that light and fire, that wisdom and zeal which are needful for the best improvement of such opportunities. And to the same source must we look in order to be fortified against the use of words and the doing of works that are bad and injurious. Number five, daily afflictions must be borne with a pious submission to the divine will. Something may happen each day to grieve us, something in our social or domestic intercourse, something in our occupations. Events relating to ourselves or to our families or friends may occasion pain and sorrow. We may be called to endure the visitations of bodily disease and suffering or severe disappointment in some cherished object or pursuit. But Christ requires of all his disciples to take up their cross daily. Matthew 16.24 We must take it up when God lays it in our way and not go a step out of the path of duty, either to meet it or to avoid it. It is not enough to bear the cross. We must acquiesce in the will of God, laying it upon us. We must see that every affliction is allotted to us by our Heavenly Father, and for the purpose of salutary discipline and instruction. And therefore we must wait on Him to learn for what fault or omission of duty, he is chastening us that we may fulfill the end for which the affliction has been sent and so be made partakers of the holiness he would thereby produce in us. O thou whose gently chastening hand in mercy deals the blow, make but thy servant understand wherefore thou layest me low. I ask thee not the rod to spare, while thus thy love I see. But oh, let every suffering bear some message, Lord, from thee. We must wait on God for support under the burdens he imposes and not seek to extricate ourselves by any sinful methods, but patiently wait until God shall see fit to remove them by the use on our part of proper efforts. Number six. The tidings and events of every day are to be awaited with a cheerful resignation to divine providence. We know not what a day or an hour even may bring forth, Proverbs 27, 1. And we are too apt to spend our thoughts in fruitless imaginings concerning the probabilities of the future in this life. Are we expecting good tidings? Let us wait on God as the giver of the good we hope for and be ready to accept it gratefully from his hand. What God has promised us, we may with assurance promise ourselves and no more. Our hopes in reference to other matters must be humble and modest, and regulated by his will, so that if the hope is deferred or disappointed, the heart will not be cast down. Are we apprehending evil tidings and melancholy events, we may wait on God to deliver us from our fears and from the things which we fear will come upon us. Psalm 34, verse 4. Or to support us, should our prayer in this regard be unanswered? Are we in suspense between hope and fear? Let us wait on God to whom belong the issues of life and of death, good and evil, and thus compose our minds into a calm and resigned posture with a humble purpose to accommodate ourselves to the event. Let us humbly hope for the best, but prepare for the worst, and then accept what God may be pleased to send. Be tranquil, O my soul, be quiet every fear. Thy Father hath supreme control, and He is ever near. Never of thy lot complain, whatever may befall. Sickness or sorrow, care or pain, tis well appointed all. A father's chastening hand is leading thee along. Nor distant is the promised land where swells the mortal song. O oh, then, my soul, be still, await heaven's high decree. Seek but to do thy father's will, 
it shall be well with thee. Communion with God in various situations. Number one, in the family. When we meet the members of the family in the morning, we are to wait upon God for the bestowment of his blessing upon them and to thank him for the mercies experienced by them during the night and to implore the bestowment of what may be needful in the future. In all our conversation with our families, the provision we make for them and the arrangements we adopt, we must wait upon God as the God of the families of Israel and have our eyes lifted to Christ as the one in whom alone the families of the earth are blessed. Number two, in the education of a family. We need to ask counsel and assistance from God and a divine blessing upon our efforts and upon the corresponding efforts of our children, not only in those matters which pertain to godliness and salvation, but even in those which belong to the present life. The members of the family also that are in childhood or youth should be taught to wait on God in all their daily studies and efforts at improvement, that they may fit themselves for usefulness in life, become ornaments to their families, comforts to their parents, benefactors to their country and to the world. Number three, in our places of daily business, we are to wait on God for his presence and blessing. Our attendance on God in our several callings should be as constant as our attendance upon those callings. God's providence is to be observed in all the occurrences which we there meet with. It should be a frequent thought. I am now in the way of my duty, and I depend upon God to bless me in it. When buying or selling, we are to remember that God's eye is upon us, observing whether we are just and honest in our dealings and do no wrong to those we deal with. In all business operations, it honors God to look to him for that sagacity and prudence which lead to success and for that honest profit which may be expected in the way of honest diligence. Number four, in our reading, we are to wait on God to guide us in our selection of books or periodicals and to aid us in turning them to a profitable account. The Holy Scriptures are of course to occupy a portion of each day's reading matter, both alone and with our families, and we need to wait upon God to assist us to read and meditate upon them and apply them as to derive the largest benefit in the way of religious impression and impulse. Time is too precious, and our accountability to God for the proper use of it too solemn to permit us to waste it in frivolous, unprofitable or demoralizing reading. When history is read, or even the daily papers, so far as they report events, we are to trace the hand of God's providence and devoutly study the plans and the attributes of God so far as daily events serve to illustrate them. Number 5. At Our Tables we are to recognize God's bountiful hand in spreading them with various articles of nourishing and agreeable food, so indispensable to comfort, health, and even life. We are to praise Him for the health and social happiness that pervade the little circle surrounding it. We are to restrain ourselves from all undue indulgence of appetite and are to partake of food with such moderation, prudence, and caution as a proper care for health and usefulness requires. Remembering God's high command that whatever we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we are to do all to the glory of God. Number six, in our social visits, made or received, we are to wait upon God with thanksgiving for valuable friends and for all their kind offices to us and for our opportunities to reciprocate such offices, also for comfortable dwellings with their various appointments adapted to us and to our friends. 
In social circles, we must so regulate our conversation that it shall be productive of good and not of harm to our friends and to ourselves. We need wisdom from God to render our conversation edifying and such as may bring honor to God and salvation to our fellow creatures. Remembering that an influence goes forth from our lips of great importance and for which we must give an account to God. It is painful and humiliating to think on how different a plan from this social visits and conversation are most generally conducted. Number 7. In acts of charity to the poor and wretched, we are to wait on God by performing those acts as unto Him, not to secure praise of men, but the approbation of God, and by asking God to accept what we do for the good of others as done in obedience to His will, and from love to His creatures and in imitation of His benign example. We are also bound to ask the divine blessing upon what we bestow in charity or in the grand operations of Christian benevolence that it may promote the happiness of those for whose benefit it is given. To such acts the scriptures hold out the powerful motive that they shall be recompensed at the resurrection of the just, nay sooner, for they speak of it as bread cast upon the waters which after many days we shall find again. Number 8. In inquiring after or reading the public news, we are to wait on God. We are to do it with an eye to Him as governing in the affairs of men. We are to maintain an habitual concern for the interests of His kingdom in the world and to observe its prosperity or the reverse. We are to read the news not simply to gratify an idle curiosity or to pass a pleasant hour, but that we may be better prepared to direct our prayers and our praises and to regulate our own conduct in reference to the kingdom of God and the welfare of our fellow men. It would greatly ennoble and make more highly useful the reading of the papers, both secular and religious if we should regard them as chronicles of the divine movements in the affairs of our world. They would thus bring us into communion with God and into sympathy with the grand movements of his all-comprehensive government. If public affairs are bright and pleasing, there is a call for grateful acknowledgement to the Most High, who ruleth in the affairs of men. If they are dark and threatening, there is a demand for humble prostration before him in the confession of sin and ill-desert, and in the supplication of mercy to avert impending evils. Number 9. In reference to the prosecution of a journey. It is proper to wait upon God to put ourselves under His protection, to depend on Him, to give His angels charge of us, that we may be carried safely through all the perils of the day, it is proper also to give thanks to God for providing us in this country with such uncommon facilities for agreeable and expeditious travel, so different from what was enjoyed a third of a century ago. We must have our eyes uplifted to God in our setting out and on our way, that we may be prepared for all the events of the journey, and if it reach a prosperous issue, have our hearts overflowing with gratitude and praise to our great preserver. Number 10. In the hours of solitude, when communing with our own hearts, we must still be waiting upon God. When we are alone, we must at the same time not be alone, but we must seek to have the Father with us, and we must commune with him. Even in solitude we shall find temptations that are to be guarded against. The Saviour himself was most strongly tempted by Satan to evil in a lonely wilderness. But in solitude we have also the best opportunity for devout reflection and contemplation if we understand the method of improving such opportunity so that we may never be less alone than when alone. If, when we sit alone, withdrawn from business and conversation, we have but the art, or rather perhaps the heart, 
to fill up these vacant minutes with pious meditations upon God and divine things. We then gather up the fragments of time which remain, and so are we found waiting on God all the day. Such a life of communion with God is a heaven upon earth. It is doing the work of heaven and the will of God, as they do it who are in heaven. It is a foretaste of the everlasting blessedness of heaven and a preparation for it. O oh, talk to me of heaven, I love, to hear about my home above. For there doth many a loved one dwell in light and joy ineffable. O oh, tell me how they shine and sing while every harp rings echoing and every glad and cheerless eye beams like the bright sun gloriously. Tell me of that victorious palm each hand in glory beareth. Tell me of that celestial calm each face in glory weareth. O oh, happy, happy country, where there entereth not a sin, and death who keeps its portals fair may never once come in. No grief can change their day to night. The darkness of that land is light. Sorrow and sighing God has sent far thence to endless banishment. And nevermore may one dark tear bedim the burning skies. For every one they shed while here in fearful agonies. Glitters a bright and dazzling gem in their immortal diadem. Some further directions for thus waiting on God all the day. Number one, observe how much may be discovered of God in created objects around us, of his wisdom and power in their creation, and of his goodness in their serviceableness to us. Look upon the wonders and the comforts that surround you, and let them all lead you to him who is the fountain of being and the giver of all good. All our springs are in him, and from him are all our steams. It is said to have been a custom with the pious Jews of the olden time to give to God the glory of whatever delight they took in any creature. When they smelled a flower, they said, Blessed be he that gave to this flower its sweetness. When they took up bread, Blessed be he that appointed bread to strengthen man's heart. Thus may we taste that God is gracious in everything that ministers to life and comfort. Number two, consider that all created objects are nothing without God. The more we discern the emptiness of the world and the insufficiency of all its enjoyments to make us happy, the more closely we shall cleave to God and the more intimately we shall hold converse with Him, in order to find in Him that satisfaction which in vain we seek from the objects of sense. Number three, live by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot, with any proper confidence, wait upon God, but in and through Jesus as our meditator by whom alone God speaks to us and allows us to speak to him. It is only by Christ that we have access to God and success in prayer, and therefore we must make mention of his righteousness, even of his only. We must exercise an habitual dependence on him who always appears in the presence of God for us. Number four, be frequent and deeply serious in pious ejaculations. In waiting upon God, we must speak to Him on all occasions, even briefly and when there is no opportunity for a lengthened prayer. Unto Thee, O Lord, says David, do I lift up my soul, or to Thee do I direct it. In a holy ejaculation, we should supplicate pardon for this sin, strength against this evil tendency, Victory over this temptation, and it shall not be in vain. This is to pray always and without ceasing. It is not the length, but the right sentiment and emotion and purpose of the prayer that give it acceptableness and value. Number five, look upon every day as one that may be the last you shall have to spend on earth. 
death will bring us all to God to be judged by him. It will bring all the saints to the fruition of him and the one we are hastening to and hope to be forever with we are concerned to wait upon and to gain an acquaintance with. Communion with God here is an indispensable preparation for the more intimate and blissful communion which we hope to enjoy with him hereafter. This is not for man to trifle, life is brief, and sin is here. Our age is but the falling of a leaf, a dropping tear. We have no time to sport away the hours. All must be earnest in a world like ours. Not many lives, but only one have we, one, only one. How sacred should that one life ever be, that narrow span? Day after day, filled up with blessed toil, hour after hour, still bringing in new spoil. O life below, how brief and poor and sad, one heavy sigh. O life above, how long and fair and glad, and endless joy. O to be done with daily dying here, O to begin the living in yon sphere.